you can see that. OK, so um, exactly. So we'll, we'll start with the first with the second session, which is uh, currently underwater uh, modeling for underwater vehicles. So now I'm going to take you a little bit back to the basics to the mathematics, so I hope it's not going to be heavy on mathematics for you. Maybe for some of you, depending on the background you're coming from, that might be a bit of a, of a recap of some material, maybe for people coming from other domains that might be some new information. So um, exactly like just a small overview of the, of the talk, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction, then I'm going to talk about reference frames and transformations. Maybe after the second part, we can take um, a brief uh, 15 minutes break, then I can con will continue with um, modeling rigid body dynamics and hydrodynamic effects for that uh, session. All right, so without further ado, so um, exactly just before I start, uh, just to some of the acronyms and notations that I'm going to be using just so that you don't get lost <laughs> during the talk. So AUV, of, of course, just a short of autonomous underwater vehicle, DOF, degree of freedom. You will also be uh, hearing me mentioning these terms. So ES, ECEF, so that's a short for Earth-Centered Earth-Fixed Frame, ECI, Earth-Centered Inertial Frame, Northeast Down, NED, Northwest Up Frame, and W. Uh, U and ROV is a remotely operated vehicle, UUV unmanned underwater vehicle that could be an AUV or an ROV or also a glider and some other mathematical terms, SO3 is just a special orthogonal group of order three. So just to give also a bit of perspective of the modeling, like what are we going to be modeling in this um, in this session basically. So here's a small um, overview that I adapted from a book of uh, Antonelli on marine robotics. So the scale that we're talking about, so you can see on the on the y axis, the time scales of these sensor platforms, how long they could be operated and on the x axis is a little bit the horizontal scale. And uh, if we talk about like the two extremes, so uh, starting with a lander, for example, that can that would have a very uh, precise spatial um, spatial scale, basically uh, down to maybe millimeters and can stay in the water like for a time up to like 10 years at max. Here's a small example of one of the um, lenders that also was part of a project here, uh, the Viator um, lander. And the other extreme would be basically a satellite, which could be deployed also up to like a frame of between a week to up to like more than 10 years and could cover. So here you can see on the X axis, that's a log scale. Um, and the underwater domain, so when we're talking about autonomous underwater vehicles and or remotely operated vehicles, you can see that they are quite close to each other. So like they could be deployed between, well, I mean, the lower <laughs> level is doesn't make so much sense, but we can talk about this upper level. So maybe an ROV like up for a day or two days and an AUV maybe up for a week or so and covering a distance of like roughly between one and 10 kilometers. And uh, a glider on the other hand, you can see here in green, um, could be deployed for longer times because it's quite efficient on energy. Um, however, um, can also be like up for a year deployed. So um, our focus will be mostly on these three. So for for when, when talking about modeling a glider, there still a little bit of specialities there, but uh, most of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about will could be applied for autonomous underwater vehicles or for remotely operated vehicles. So just a small definition. Um, the term model that I'm going to be talking about is a mathematical relation that describes basically or that connects the robot's motion states and control inputs. And mathematically, we can define two kinds of models, either a forward model, so assuming that X is our state and U is our control input. Um, X dot or the time derivative of the state is a function of the current state and the action or the input. And an inverse model is the other way around. So if I have my current state, my future state, um, the inverse model would predict for me the control input or the action that I need um, to, to achieve that. Um, also, just a small overview of 
kinds of models. So what are the different types of models? So we can talk about generally three kinds of models for underwater vehicles, control models that are kind of lower order models. They are a little bit lightweighted models that are used, for example, for model based controller designs, mostly for like canceling out some nonlinearities in, this, in, the, in the motion. Um, as I mentioned, they are like low complexity because you need fast prediction uh, online. And um, just a few examples could be like feed forward control or a linear quadratic regulator kind of control or, or MPC or model predictive control. Um, secondly, uh, are observer models. These are models that could be used in some kind of a navigation filter, for example, as a propagation function. Um, could also be a probabilistic, uh, provide a probabilistic description of the of the system just to capture also some of the disturbances and sensor noise. And um, they also could be used as an inverse model in an update step. Um, got to talk about that a little bit later. And lastly, are simulation models, which are the most complex models. So if we're talking about control models or observer models, like they are usually differential equations, like up to maybe six uh, dimensions or 12 dimensions. We're talking about simulation models. Maybe we are solving like, I don't know, up to 90 or 100 differential equations in the same time. Of course, they are higher fidelity. They can describe the system more accurately. However, they are not so feasible, for example, to deploy in a real system. Uh, they could, for example, include collisions, uh, sensor models, and some environmental disturbances. And here to the right, you can see a little bit of a figure kind of connecting all three models together. So you have a model-based controller that controls an underwater vehicle, or this is the simulation model of an underwater vehicle, or we can simulate, for example, ocean currents, collisions, and then the observer or the model-based observer is kind of trying to capture the states of the of the um, vehicle and then feeding it back into the controller. All right, so um, next we're going to talk a bit about reference frames. How do we find reference frames for um, describing the motion of underwater vehicles and the transformations between those frames? So um, some of the most basic um, reference frames, if we're talking about navigation on Earth, uh, when we're talking about space, we have to talk about different kind of frames. Um, two of the most basic reference frames that we can define are like the Earth centered inertial frame, which is a, ref, a frame which is centered on the center of the Earth with the X and Y axis on the equator plane. And this frame is basically fixed in space. So, um, or not fixed in space, it's fixed with the Earth. However, it doesn't rotate with the Earth. So it just keeps um, a fixed orientation, let's say. And uh, the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame is also fixed with the Earth and also rotates with the Earth. So um, this frame is not really an inertial frame. Uh, however, we can assume it's an inertial frame uh, just because simply the Earth rotates. However, if we're talking about small robots such as AUVs that are not traveling a very big distance or not going at a very high speed, we can assume since the Coriolis forces that are going to be applied on these robots is quite negligible. Um, two other um, kinds of frames are uh, what we call like uh, geographical reference frames, which are more of like a tangent plane to a point on the Earth. And then uh, we can define, for example, like the north east down. This is the most common reference frame uh, that is used for describing um, underwater vehicles. So, um, of course, uh, north east and the down is basically pointing towards the, the center of the Earth and the other way around is the northwest up. So these we can assume that they are as well uh, inertial frames. So, so, so that an object within this frame or some point that has a mass is only going to be accelerated only if a force is applied on it. Um, here is like some of the um, conventions that are used within like the um, navigation community. Let's say uh, one of them is called the Universal Transverse Mercator or UTM. Uh, this is a coordinate frame that we could also use as a northeast down or a northwest up frame. Um, 
it's basically defined. So we take the Earth globe divided into like 60 longitudinal um, spaces and 20 latitude uh, slices. And then here you can see, for example, on the right side, the UTM zones of, of Europe. Um, however, I mean, this could be used if you want to talk about, um, as I said, one of these inertial frames. However, there are some of the issues uh, that you might have to take care about there is like, because this is kind of a tangent plane and the earth like is, is round. So if you go towards the edges of these frames, you will have a little bit problems when, when you talk about the um, the Z dimension. So because this curvature will have to you have to project it on a on a plane. And this also uh, has an error when you kind of want to move between different zones. So this special curve has to be taken there. All right, so another a uh, frame we will talk about is the, let's say, body frame. This is a frame that we will always attach to the vehicle to describe the motion of the vehicle with respect to it. So a convention that we will use here is that we will attach this frame onto some arbitrary point in the body of the vehicle, as you can see in this figure. And the X axis is kind of pointed from the center towards the fore of the vehicle, if, the, if your vehicle has a certain kind of geometry or you can tell that it has a fore and an, and an aft or like a left and right uh, parts. Um, so the Y axis is from the center in the starboard direction and the Z axis is pointing downwards. And uh, just also to define a bit the degrees of freedom here, so uh, what we will call surge is a motion along the longitudinal axis of the of the vehicle or among the OB XB uh, vector. Uh, sway is the transversal motion and heave is the vertical motion. And we will also define rotations. So roll is a rotation around the long longitudinal axis. The pitch is a rotation about the transversal axis and the yaw is a rotation about the vertical axis. So um, also just some conventions. Uh, so this is like one of the conventions that we will use here is the convent notation of the Society of Naval Architectures and um, uh, Marine Engineers that was defined around 1950. So um, you can see here in this um, in this column, basically the degree of freedom that we're talking about, we're going to describe position and Euler angles or orientations as x, y, z and phi theta psi. Um, linear and angular velocities in the body frame. We're going to define them as UVW and PQR and forces and moments also in the body frame are capital X, capital Y, Z and KMN. And we will have these representations. So position is a vector P kind of composed of X, Y, Z. The big phi is uh, represents the uh, orientation and that's part of a sphere of a uh, three-dimensional sphere and uh, the velocities, this vector nu uh, describes the linear velocities and omega describes the angular velocities. These are in the real uh, set of order three. So um, let's talk about a bit about rotation matrices. So um, this is also a bit of a probably a recap uh, from some lectures that you might have taken uh, at university. So um, a rotation matrix between, we're going to define R to be a rotation matrix between two frames A and V, denoted as the following. So R subscript B superscript A. And this uh, matrix is an element of the special orthogonal group three, which means that if R belongs to this group, it has to be a subset of the real um, set of the or of um, order three by three and such that r is orthogonal and the determinant of r is equal to one so orthogonal means that if i take the transpose of this r and multiply it by itself or the other way around so r multiplied by r transpose is going to be equal to the identity matrix um, another notation that we're going to be using is also the following so if i have a vector um, with the subscript, so the subscript two is going to be on this side, and then R. So always the uh, subscript is from. So this is where uh, 
from the re reference frame that um, I'm going to be transforming this vector and then the upper script is two. Um, see some questions. Settings upside down. I'm not really sure what do you mean there. All right, sorry. Um, all right, so another definition here is um, the so-called skew symmetry matrix, which is also part of the uh, skew symmetry group, let's say. And uh, we're going to define a skew symmetry matrix of order n is said to be skew symmetrical if a matrix is equal if we take the transpose and multiply it by, by minus, it's going to give us back the same uh, matrix. So um, another thing, so the cross product operator. So if we have um, the cross product of two vectors, let's say here lambda A is basically the same as, as the skew symmetric matrix of the vector lambda multiplied by vector A. So just some revisions. Um, so let's define first of all the what is the Euler rotation uh, theorem so basically Euler said a couple of years back um, in a three-dimensional space any displacement of a body that keeps one point on the body uh, fixed is equivalent basically to a single rotation about a certain axis that runs through this uh, fixed point or well, this is what we call the angle axis description of rotation. So this rotation, basically, we can describe it by an angle alpha in the range of minus pi pi uh, around a fixed unit vector omega hat, also called the Euler axis, that basically runs through this uh, fixed point. And this rotation matrix um, R omega alpha is basically going to be given by this formula. So this is, as I said, the Euler formula, so basically just cosine of this alpha multiplied by the identity matrix, one minus cosine alpha by um, the omega hat multiplied by the transpose of it, and sine alpha by the skew symmetric matrix of, of omega. And if we expand this equation, basically we can arrive at the description of the rotation matrix, which is a three by three matrix. It's a bit complicated, but I mean, quite easy to derive. OK, so taking this rotation matrix, let's first try to describe the transformation of velocity between the body frame and the um, inertial frame or the fixed frame. Um, so of course, uh, we're going to base this at this point on um, Euler angles or roll pitch yaw, and we will decompose the body frame as said in into the northeast down uh, frame. So the rotation here is going to be from the body frame to the inertial frame as a function of phi. And basically, we're transforming the vector uh, v here, or the velocity in the body frame, back to the time derivative of the position. So that's basically simply just the composition of three rotations. So if we take the vehicle that is in some kind of orientation, if we first rotate about its z-axis with, with an angle psi, then followed by um, a rotation about its y-axis with a, with an angle phi and finally uh, sorry theta and finally a rotation about the x-axis with an angle uh, phi we will arrive at the full transformation from this uh, vector v into the uh, vector in the inertial frame and that is basically what i just mentioned so we take three principal uh, rotation in this order so z y x and then we could have a rotation matrix of that form. Now, um, uh, another thing that we mentioned since R is part of SO3, so the inverse of R is basically, so the rotation between the body frame to the inertial frame uh, inverse is the same as the rotation from the inertial frame to the body frame, which basically just takes the transpose of this uh, rotation matrix. So it's gonna be transpose of rotation around x, transpose rotation about y, and transpose rotation about z. Um, exactly, so this is basically just the linear velocity transformations. 
uh, moving on to the angular transformations. So that's also if we take a bit the um, if we start the other way around here. So let's let's take that this figure here. So first of all, if you notice that the angular transformation about or the angular velocity about the axis x is the same as phi uh, dot because we are already aligned. So it's the same as the Euler rate uh, of uh, roll in this case. Now, if we transform back, basically, so we rotate this angle phi back, then we are aligned with the y-axis, which is basically then the theta dot is uh, equivalent to like the, just the inverse transformation only with the angle phi. This would give us basically the second component in the body frame. And then if we rotate again, then we are basically also having the uh, rotation rate about the z axis aligned. So that basically gives us the inverse transformation. So in this case, we like started the other way around. So we are taking the transformation in, sorry, the angular velocity in body frame um, with as a relation to the Euler rates. I mean, Euler rates physically, it's a little bit hard to grasp what do they mean, but angular velocity in body frame is a little bit more easier to capture. So if you just take any body, uh, define these axes, try to rotate it, you can you can easily, let's say, grasp the idea of uh, angular velocities in a body frame. And uh, exactly, so this, we will describe it as a matrix T of phi, so this is T minus one, which basically if we just expand this uh, relation here, we will get this kind of matrix. However, if we try to inverse that, um, that matrix, uh, we will get a matrix of this kind. So if you notice here, uh, this is a division by cosine theta. So you can see that um, this is what is called basically the gimbal lock in an Euler angle. So if we try to go from Euler rates, uh, or sorry, from angular velocity to Euler rates, if we have, we will have singularities at any angle, which is theta, which is basically 2n plus 1 pi. So any odd number multiplying pi by 2 is, uh, will have a singularity in this relation. So, and another thing is that the transpose in this case is, this is not a rotation matrix. This is another kind of transformation. So the transpose is not equal to the inverse of the matrix. Um, sorry, so, uh, Milind? Um, is anyone else having that problem or can everyone see my screen? So, uh, it does work for me perfectly. Okay. But then, uh, please, uh, Milind, uh, for pronouncing your name right. So if you just can log out and log in again, probably it should work. All right. Okay, so um, to solve the, that issue, we can talk about something called quaternions or quaternion representation. Um, so just a small recall uh, from the oil, from the angle axis uh, representation, we had the relation that the rotation matrix is basically of that form. We can rearrange it to have this kind of form. So basically, if we just do a little bit of medical manipulation, we will arrive at this form basically, which is just the identity matrix, sine of alpha, skew, uh, symmetric matrix of the omega hat and one minus cosine alpha S square omega hat. Um, we will define basically a quaternion to be a complex number that has a real part we call eta and an imaginary part, which is this epsilon in this case. So this is one real number and this is a vector of three imaginary parts. You can see here, this is epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three. And um, these, these quaternions or the, the values of these quaternions, we will, we will define them based on these rotations, alpha and the principal rotation axis um, hat of, of omega. And this is basically according to this equation. So we're just going to define eta to be the 
cosine of half of this rotation and the epsilon part to be the um, the, uh, the vector omega hat by the sine of uh, the rotation angle. And if we take those, plug them back here, uh, sorry, before that, uh, one important um, condition of quaternions is also that the uh, if we take a quaternion, a transpose of a quaternion multiplied by itself, we will always have this unity um, property. So um, squared of eta by uh, epsilon transpose epsilon is always equal to one. Exactly. So basically, that's what I just said. So if we take those using this property and and these two equations, if we take those and plug them back in here, we could arrive at the rotation in, fun in terms of the quaternion um, description, which would be basically, um, so of course you have to do a bit of simplification to, to reach this, uh, this term. So that will be the identity uh, matrix of third order times two eta, this um, skew of epsilon plus the two uh, squared epsilon of uh, squared symmetric matrix um, of epsilon. So if we expand this, we can also derive the rotation matrix in terms of um, the components of the quaternion. So now how can we go? So this is basically having a quaternion. We can describe from that a rotation matrix, but how can we find these quaternions if we have the rotation matrix? So basically, if we just take, if you look a little bit at these diagonal elements and use this property here, we can arrive at in this uh, formula. So basically, the real part is basically just 1 uh, over 2, the square root of 1 plus the diagonal elements. And the imaginary part is 1 over 4 eta with some of the off-diagonal uh, terms of the rotation matrix. All right, so some of the uh, properties as well here. So if we are now talking about um, the angle or the the rotation rates, so if we want to try to um, transform omega or the rotation rates in body frame to the time derivative of uh, that equation, so basically we will take the time derivative of, of that q and then we will arrive at this equation. So q dot will be 1 over 2, a big omega matrix, uh, or matrix operator, we're going to also like describe it as another uh, transformation T of Q, and this um, uh, half or, or this matrix operator is basically derived or can be can have this form, or if we just um, so this is if we're talking about uh, this form uh, or this <coughs> matrix as a function of the uh, of the angular uh, rotations. Or the angular rates, and if we're talking about it in the terms of quaternions, it's going to be this uh, form. So, also some properties of uh, quaternions. So the inverse of this uh, transformation. So if we take these two and um, the transpose and multiply it by itself, we're going to arrive at the quarter of an identity matrix. So basically, the, we can we can write here the inverse of the transformation, or basically what is um, the angular rate in terms of the um, time derivative of a quaternion. So um, here just a simple note. So um, for a quaternion representation, the angle alpha should not be minus pi or pi because this will have um, um, sorry, no. Uh, if the rotation is not minus pi or pi, the this the real part can be written as follows. And uh, basically, uh, this means that we can always recover the real part only from the imaginary part. So this kind of we can use this trick, as I said, only if alpha is not plus or minus pi. We can use this trick basically to reduce uh, our states from four, which is the quaternion vector, which is this over representation, down to three again. And this relation basically will be q dot will be half of 
the matrix Q multiplied by omega, and then Q would only be the, we just take out one of the um, rows of the, of the, of the matrix uh, T here. Okay, so this basically brings us to the full uh, transformations. So if we're talking about, if we combine them in, in one uh, vectorial uh, form, so if we're talking about Euler angles, then the time derivative of the position and the time derivative of Euler angles is one big transformation matrix, let's call it J of E of the Euler angles phi, multiplying if we just stack those two uh, linear and angular velocities, so that's going to be of that form. And if we're talking about a quaternion, uh, quaternion representation, then we will have P dot Q dot is a transformation of, of the function of the quaternion angle Q, multiplying the linear angle velocities and we'll take this form. So this basically provides us with the kinematics um, of that uh, of this, or so just talking about velocities. So if we can measure velocity in the body frame, we can transform it to this um, position rate and uh, orientation rate, and then do an integration to get uh, with one time step to get the position and orientation. However, this is quite straightforward if we're talking about Euler representation, if we're talking about quaternions, uh, this is a little bit tricky because if you integrate a quaternion in the classical form, then you will leave the sphere and then this will not uh, satisfy anymore. Or since we have uh, integration errors, this will not satisfy anymore the, the property that the quaternion has to be a unit quaternion. So here's a small uh, trick just to um, integrate quaternions. So we can recall from this form that Q dot is basically half of this matrix omega multiplied by, by Q. And if we expand this matrix omega, we can, we can have this, uh, this kind of representation. So Q dot will be one over two by, so this is basically omega if you just expand it, or, so this is, the matrix is a function of the angular velocities, or it could be of the matrix, uh, a function of the quaternion multiplying the angular velocities. So this basically, we can define a kind of an operator, which is the multiplication operator. So then Q dot would be basically uh, half of Q, this uh, circle times omega, or we can just switch them. So this will not affect anything. And basically this, this operator is kind of taking this matrix here. So if we take that um, that equation, so basically as if we are solving an ordinary dif differential equation, because this, if we take basically this kind of transfer, this kind of uh, representation here at a single point in time, this is just um, a matrix of the form A basically. And that's basically uh, just a differential equation that we know quite well the solution of it, which is basically just an exponential of this matrix at time t minus time zero, and then q zero is the starting uh, point or the, the point that we are starting with. Now this exponential, since it's an exponential of a quaternion, um, is defined according to the following. So this is basically just expanding the quaternion in a complex number. So that will be the exponential of the real uh, part times the cosine of the modulus of the um, of the um, sorry imaginary part plus uh, imaginary part kind of scaled times the sine of that uh, modulus, and that basically uh, would give us the following uh, quaternion or the integration of a quaternion. So if we have if we have an an omega or angular uh, rates in body frame, and we are trying to integrate within uh, some time delta t, we can get this exponential, or it's called also exponential map, of that of that form, and then do this um, star or this multiplication, sorry, circle uh, multiplication by the original quaternion that you have. So that's basically the function of t, which kind of respects the um, that the quaternion has to be always a unit quaternion. 
All right, so um, that's it for reference frames and transformations. Wow. Wow. Wow.